Hello, I'm Katie in Seattle. My co-host Tiffany lives in Rome. Support for The Bittersweet Life comes from our listeners. This week, I want to thank Kay for making a donation through PayPal. You helped us cover July's bills. Thank you so much. My thanks also to Lindy and Warren for joining us on Patreon. I hope you love those bonus episodes. Every month, we release two bonus episodes where we often answer questions we don't address on the show, like... How do we feel about our exes? Or what is it really like to guard the Vatican? Or coming up in August, do we even eat pasta when we're not in Italy? If you love the show, help us pay for it. There are links in the show notes. Or you can click the donate button at our website, thebittersweetlife.net. Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. And today, we're coming up to mid-July, which means, Tiffany, soon you will be traveling in the United States. Whew! And I've been reading this book called Outline by an author named Rachel Cusk. She's basically just writing little vignettes of people and experiences she's having while living in Greece while she's there teaching a writing course. And this one section that I read recently reminded me of a whole bunch of questions that I wanted to ask you. And we love talking about language on this show. And so some of this is going to tread into territory we've covered, but I thought maybe there would be a few other things in here. So I'm going to read you a small passage. All right. And then you can tell me what it makes you think of, but um, I also just wrote down different questions that it arose in me. Okay. So this is at the very end of the book, and she's talking to another writing teacher who has arrived to take her place. They're both English-speaking women, Our author is about to leave town. This new uh, writing teacher has just arrived, and she's going to be taking over the class. Okay. And here's what she says. She asked me how long I had been there, what the students were like, and whether I had been to Athens before. She wasn't quite sure how the language barrier was going to work. It was a funny idea, writing in a language that's not your own. It almost makes you feel guilty, she said the way people feel forced to use English, how much of themselves must get left behind in that transition, like people being told to leave their homes and take only a few essential items with them. Yet there was also a purity to that image that attracted her, filled as it was with possibilities for reinvention. To be freed from clutter, both mental and verbal, was in some ways an appealing prospect. Until you remembered something you needed that you had had to leave behind, She, for instance, found herself unable to make jokes when she spoke in another language. In English, she was by and large a humorous person, but in Spanish, for instance, which at one time she had spoken quite well, she was not. So it was not, she imagined, a question of translation so much as it was of adaptation. The personality was forced to adapt to its new linguistic circumstances, to create itself anew. It was an interesting thought. There was a poem, she said, by Beckett, that he had written twice, once in French and once in English, as if to prove that his bilinguality made him two people, and that the barrier of language was ultimately impassable. That's interesting. That's interesting, especially that last little line there. That really makes you think. I can, I can see why you came up with the idea to do an episode based on that, that passage. I know. <laughs> You could do an episode based on every section of this book, probably. And I've been really resisting just reading the entire book to you. <laughs> but, but okay, well, so what's your first reaction to that idea of, uh, especially that last idea that even being completely bilingual, the barrier is impassable. You are ultimately two different people. Oh, I don't know. I have to sort of sit with this for a second. I mean, I don't think it's that extreme. I wouldn't say that you're two different people, Mm -hmm. but there is definitely a a shift that happens from one language to the next. And I wonder if it's as dramatic when you're fluent in both languages. Mm -hmm. It's much more dramatic, you know, when one of the languages you speak much better than the other. And so, you know, for example, this person is not able to be humorous in Spanish, and that's a big part of her personality. If she spoke both languages fluently from birth, 
she would most likely be able to be humorous in both languages. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that, that definitely your level in the language is going to play a part in how different you are in each language. True. How about for you? I mean, I know you're fluent. I'm but. well. I, I mean, I'm fluent in a certain. I'm fluent, but I'm not a native speaker, and so there is a distinction there. I'm fluent in the sense that I can talk to anyone about most anything, you know, within reason. But that doesn't mean I understand everything, and that doesn't mean I'm able to express myself exactly the way that I want to. Heck, I can barely express myself in English lately. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you have to go back to losing languages for that discussion. I definitely am funnier in it in English for sure, but I am funny in Italian too. I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd have to ask Claudio, but I think I'm funny in Italian now. <laughs> but I certainly wasn't when I first was speaking it. I do think there is something about the language itself and the way that it's spoken. That I mean, for example, when I'm in the states, or when my mom is here, or when we, my husband and I, are in the states with my mom. She often thinks that we're fighting when we're just talking. Hmm. Um, she's like, what are you guys fighting about? I'm like, oh, we're not fighting. <laughs> we're just talking. We're just talking about where we want to go for lunch or <laughs> we're talking about, you know, something stupid. What is it? Because it's more rapid fire or louder? Yeah. You know, the tone of your voice, not the, necessarily the volume, but the actual tone is higher. You speak at a higher pitch. I do anyway. And I think you do maybe speak a little bit louder. And it's just something in the physical way the language is. I mean, the same way that French is, you know, sexy. It's just, it's just sexy, the way that it sounds. And, it, you know, maybe it's not connected. I mean, you know, people think it's a stereotype that French people are sexy. Is it because the language is so sexy? Does that just make them, like, by consequence, also sexy? Or is it not related? I don't know. But, I mean, the language, if you listen to the language, I mean, it's very sort of whispered, but at the same time guttural, but guttural in a very soft way, not in the harsh way that German is guttural. Like, I wonder how the actual language itself, the sound of the language, influences sort of the national character of the people kind of an interesting idea yeah so in that in that quandary that still kind of goes with the theory that you would be slightly two different people yeah for sure that you are uh when you're wrapped up in the italian world you're a a different tiffany uh there's a distinction there which is interesting what about what about i'm kind of reminded of two things but Remember a couple weeks ago when you had Aurelio and his friend Giacomo on the show on our Thursday episode? Yeah, y- Jacopo. Jacomo. Jacomo. Yeah, Different sorry. name. It's it's the Italian form of Jacob, not the Italian form of Jack. Mm. Giacomo is Jack. So this is Jacob. Uh, I or stand Jacopo. corrected. My apologies. <laughs> but when you had them on, there was this great moment where you're talking to Aurelio's friend and then you turn to Aurelio and you ask him the same question. And he starts to answer you in Italian and you say, no, in English. And he gives this wonderful (sighs) (laughs) sigh. And you say, okay, you can answer in Italian. And then he answers you in Italian. But I don't know, as we're talking about this, I'm wondering if even for him that there is this some sort of big enough shift that he has to make there that at times it feels exhausting. (sighs) It could, it could be, it could be. He's pretty good at switching back and forth, but when he's talking about something that happened at school, he will go into Italian. Even if we're in the middle of a conversation in English, he wants to tell me something that happened at school, he tells me in Italian. Because it happened in Italian. He remembers it in Italian. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. The switching languages, I think it is exhausting when you're not used to it. I'm so used to it now because I live with, I mean, I speak two different languages in my own house, depending on who I'm talking to, that it's gotten to the point where it's, it's very easy for me to switch. It used to be harder when I was sort of first living here. I would want to speak one or the other, but now it's gotten to the point where I just go back and forth so much that, that I don't even remember sometimes what language a conversation happened in. Yeah, you also sent me this video 
or I guess you posted it on social media recently where you're sitting at a table with a whole bunch of different people, kids and adults, where there's a whole bunch of different languages being spoken. What is that like as far as how you feel as a person when you're in a situation like that? Well, I've always loved that. When I was in undergrad, I sought out all the international students. And I was lucky there were a lot of them, probably because it was, you know, it was a music school. So musicians from all over the world came to that school. And I just wanted to be in a place with as many different people from different countries as possible with different languages and immerse myself in that. So I've always really appreciated that. But yeah, I mean, to say what it's like, I mean, it's definitely interesting. So we went to the lake with these friends of ours. So it's my husband's colleague who is Brazilian, but has lived in Italy almost his entire life. So for him, Italian is pretty much his first language now. He speaks both. Uh, his wife is Polish. And then, of course, Claudia is Italian and, and, and I'm American. And they have a little boy, two-year-old boy, not even two. It was funny because I posted that on, on Instagram and then someone, a Polish person who follows me wrote back and said she's saying eat your lunch and then we can go to the lake and we were, we were that's where we were that's, I mean I, I not that I did, wouldn't have believed her but it was just so funny to me because I listened to this recording a couple times when I was posting it and I had no idea what she was saying mm -hmm. and then here someone posts this is what she's saying and I'm like yeah that totally makes sense that that would be what she was saying <laughs> what is the common language at that table Italian Italian is the only language that all of us speak. The father probably speaks a smattering of English. He does speak a smattering of English, and she does as well. But I'm sure neither of them speak English as well as I speak Italian. So Italian would be like the language that we would all, all of us would understand. But it's interesting. She was talking about, you know, her son does not go to school yet, and her husband works quite a lot. She is at home, also expecting another baby. And you know, I said to her, I asked her, I mean, I kind of felt stupid when I asked her because people ask me this question and I'm like, uh, duh, of course he does. People ask me, does your son speak English? And I'm like, uh, uh obviously he speaks English. I mean, mm -hmm. me having no self-awareness, I'm like, does he speak Polish? <laughs> She's like, yeah, actually he speaks Polish better than he speaks Italian. He is quite a bit younger than Aurelio, you know, he's not almost six. He's, he's not even two. So even lots of kids at that age don't speak anything. She said, no, because he's with me so much. He speaks Polish all the time. He much prefers to speak in Polish. And she said that, you know, he had a, a moment where it was probably something so fleeting. But, you know, when you're a first time parent, you're like, oh, my gosh. You know, he stuttered like one time. And they were like, oh, my gosh, we got to take him to the speech pathologist, you know, <laughs> and we got to take him to the child psychologist, you know, just in case. And she happens to be a psychologist as well, though she doesn't, she's not able to practice in Italy because she doesn't have the Italian license, but she is trained as a psychologist. And, and you know, she took her son, they, they took him to the psychologist. And the first thing the psychologist was said was, you need to stop speaking to him in Polish. Oh. He's not going to be able to uh, learn Italian properly, which is totally antiquated way of thinking. I mean, there have been so many studies that have proven beyond a doubt that bilingualism is only beneficial for children, especially if they start really young and it's if that both of their parents, it's their native languages. I mean, there's like, there's zero detriment to it. The only detriment you might have is that the child might start speaking a little bit later. But even if they do, I mean, they're going to catch up. Mm -hmm. If the child starts speaking at three instead of at two, there's, it's not like at, at 20, they're, they're going to be behind. <laughs> yeah, right. But yes, every child is going to have a different path, maybe a different preference, you know, it might depend on the child, what language they gravitate towards. Yeah, certainly. So going back to this idea of a bilingual person could be two people, this concept that they are two people, depending on what language they're speaking, from your observation of Aurelio, your son, now five, would you say that he seems like two different people? Is he a different little boy when he's speaking Italian versus the little boy that's speaking English? I think he is different, a little bit. I wouldn't say he's two different people. What would you notice? What's the observation of what's different? I don't know. I don't know that there's anything that I could put my finger on. He's definitely very excitable in both languages. There is a difference, but I think it's slight. I definitely don't think he's got two personalities, one in English and one in Italian. 
if anything, I mean, he has less experience speaking with like a broad range of people in English. Right. So he might be different because he's mainly speaking English to his mom. Yeah. Yeah. Who he tends to be very sweet toward and very <laughs> affectionate toward. He is. I do notice that every time he talks to the podcast listeners, he's telling them how much they lo- he loves them. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think he always thinks that like he's on a podcast because every time he sees my phone, because every so often I'll be like, I'll be recording a, a voice message to you mm-hmm. or to someone else. Just, I was recording a voice message to somebody the other day. And he was talking in the background and he's like, hi, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, this isn't a podcast episode, honey. This is just a a message. Mm -hmm. And he he sometimes, as you know, refers to me as Tiffany Parks, Bittersweet Life. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's my full name. When he wants to get my attention, he'll be like, Tiffany Parks, Bittersweet Life. Listen. (laughs) (laughs) That's very funny. Now, if you had known... That that was going to happen. You might have wanted to name this show differently. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. I still like it after all these years. Yeah, yeah. Well, what about this other concept that they get to a little bit is about the funny idea of writing in a language that isn't your own. So, of course, in this book, they are both teachers of writing in English and they are in Greece. So their students are hypothetically Greek writing in English in their class. But do you have much experience writing in Italian? something more lengthy than a note to Claudio. I did. You know, it's funny that you ask that because I did for, I don't even know what reason. I was writing in my journal the other day, maybe a couple weeks ago. And I was like, I'm going to write in my journal in Italian today. Just, just because Mm. I really enjoyed it. And I mean, I don't, I don't think it was very long. I think it was maybe a page or two. I don't remember what I wrote because it was several weeks ago now. And I doubt that I went very deep but it was a fun exercise. And I, I would assume, although I, I can't say this outright because, you know, I've only done it once, but I would assume that doing something like journaling in another language, if you, if you write it well enough, would almost access like a different part of your mind. Because, I mean, they have proven that when you speak a foreign language, your brain does light up in a different way, especially if it's not a language that you've spoken from birth. If it's still technically a foreign language to you. Your mind sort of lights up in different places. So I'm thinking, if I'm writing in Italian, in, just in my journal, am I going to have different thoughts? Are different things going to pop up into my head? Different, am I going to come to different conclusions? Am I going to have different insights? It's something to explore. And did you find anything like that when you were writing it? Yeah, I don't think I, was, I, don't think I wrote for long enough. I think it would be a fun practice to see, like, you know, over maybe weeks or months to see if something comes up. And then the idea of writing fiction in a foreign language. I mean, I would never write anything and attempt to publish it in anything but English. I don't have that confidence. But it might be fun to try to draft something in a foreign language just to see if something pops out at you. Like, for example, I'm writing a book that takes place in Italy. All of the characters in the book are Italian, but they speak English in the book because the book is in English. What if I wrote their dialogue in Italian? And of course, eventually translated into English for publication. But but what if I wrote in Italian? Like, would something else pop up? Would their characters be different? Yeah, and would the rhythm of how they talk be different? Yeah, but also like their personalities. Mm-hmm. We all have the experience of reading a book that takes place in a, in, in another language but that is written in your own language. And, you know, I'm thinking about some of the dialogue of some of my characters. How would that come out if it were in Italian? Would I even know how to write that in Italian, like in that specific way? I don't know. It might be a fun exercise to try, though. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, because I, as you know, read an early draft of your book. Right. I have not seen where you have gone from there, because that was, what, over a year ago now. Mm Mm-hmm. But your characters do seem English. Do they? Well, particularly your central female character feels on the English side to me. You know, almost like she is from England transported into. Like if I had to say, if anyone seems like an English speaker, it would be her. 
of everybody. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this could be kind of a fun exercise, actually. Could be. Would she be like so blatantly Italian if you were to rewrite everything she says in Italian? I mean, here's the thing. The book also takes place in 1599. Right. So <laughs> it's very difficult. I mean, it's hard enough to capture, you know, what is it that makes someone, besides the language, what is it that makes someone Italian? Mm-hmm. Besides their the way they look and their language, what is it? Yeah. But then to say, okay, Italian in 1599. I mean, I don't have any direct experience, <laughs> you know, with that. True. So it's True. it's hard. And and I am so influenced by historical fiction and also just shows and movies that I've watched, period pieces. Mm-hmm. And so many of them take place in England. That's true. Yeah, that's true. From Wolf Hall to... You know, Downton Abbey, obviously Downton Abbey is a totally different era, but this is my first attempt at, at historical fiction. And so I find myself, I'm writing these scenes, like the dinner scene, you know, and I'm like, Tiffany, it's not Downton Abbey. There's not a footman, okay? <laughs> this is the right, you know? <laughs> It's like, why do you think, every, it's like every time I think historical fiction, especially if it's a dining room scene, I'm like, okay, Downton Abbey, there's a <laughs> footman standing beside, behind the table and he's giving them a fork. And I, as I'm really going off topic here, but it's a constant writing historical fiction. I'm sure anyone else out there who writes historical fiction can relate. It's a constant exercise in asking yourself this question. Was that a thing? Mm -hmm. Were forks a thing? Was tea a thing? Was coffee a thing? Mm -hmm. Was chocolate a thing? Like when, when was chocolate imported to Europe? When was coffee imported? When was tea imported? When did they have this stuff? When did, you know, I'm like writing this scene about how they're having port after dinner. And I'm like, wait a second. (laughs) Would they have had port? port? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like they're not in Portugal. Or I remember when I was first writing the first draft of the last, you know, because I'm writing the second book in the series now. And I'm like, did they have torches on the sides of the streets? And yes, some private homes had torches on the sides of their buildings that they kept there to keep their street safe, but it wasn't like something that the city provided. So it's just, it's a, it's almost a bottomless pit of Googling, was this a thing? Yeah. (laughs) At least you can Google it. I had to take an historical fiction class when I was in college And I remember the teacher giving us a list of resources and also making us go practice being in the library so that we could try to sort out those kinds of things. And there were these books that would just, from my vague memory of this, there was like these books that you could look up that would basically just have eras yeah. and you could look up almost like it was a dictionary. Well, see, that's what I want, Katie. I, I would I know, trade, I know, I would but... trade the Google for that mm-hmm. because Google doesn't go deep enough and you can't find, I mean, you can find resources, but you can't find the detail. And you also don't know, you know, like if, if they're trustworthy sources, there's got to be a book out there that's like, Pick a year or pick a decade or whatever, an era. And this is what dinner was like. This is what the clothes were like. This is what bathing was like. This is how they did it. <laughs> like, I can't figure it out. One of the things I did for work last year was I did a research project for Anthony Doerr, who's the writer who wrote All the Light We Cannot See. And he has a new book that's coming out in late September called Cloud Cuckoo Land. That I've already read. It's great. But he had me do some research for him over one of, what happens to one of the characters. Just to make sure that what he wanted to have happen could happen. You know, he was basically having me like fact check mm-hmm. certain aspects. And I don't want to say of what because it kind of ruins the book. But, but he also said at one point, I don't need to know that it like have it be perfect. I just need it to be plausible. Yeah, that is so important. And I think that is something that every historical fiction writer needs to eventually realize and that when you do realize because I think when you start out you're like everything has to be perfect you know but when you realize that it's kind of like ah oh, it's a sense of relief it doesn't mean you're off the hook it doesn't mean you can write about Caravaggio and say that he was walking around Rome in 1620 because he died in 1610 you know so you know you don't want to do that but I have in my book that I just finished Caravaggio is jailed and, you know, he never was jailed for that. He was jailed for something else. 
But in my story, it's fiction. At yeah. the end of the day, it's fiction. Right. And that's ultimately what the reader has to know, too, is like, if you read Wolf Hall, this is not a historical accounting of what actually occurred. Yes. This is somebody's imagining of how it might have happened. Yeah. Which hopefully most readers know. But I, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of our faulty information comes from movies and stories because... You know, you feel like if you watch the Tudors, you now have a deep understanding of what it was to be Henry VIII. And really, <laughs> you know, they might have made that a little sexier than it would have been to be Henry VIII. So it's interesting. But back to the topic at hand. I have one more question before we leave it behind. Since you are about to be traveling in the United States, and maybe you don't have an answer, and this is something you could just watch for while you're over here, but it comes back to Claudio. The two Claudios... Italian speaking Claudio and the English speaking Claudio. Mm. One, do you have a take on him on whether or not he's kind of different in each language? Well, I do think he he is more than Aurelio. Mm-hmm. Because Aurelio was born in both languages and Claudio didn't start speaking English until he was, you know, 30 or something. So, I do, and I prefer him in English actually. Really? I do tell tell us I mean, more about that. He's so, it's, it's, he's very cute in English. I'm not saying he's not cute in Italian, but he's cute in like, in like an innocent way because he's disarmed. He's vulnerable. He's less certain. And I don't know why that makes him somehow more charming and more uh, sympathetic. I like it more. I mean, I like him in both languages, of course, but... There's something about, and also I think part of it is simply the novelty of it. You know, when he first started speaking English, I used to beg him to speak English with me. Not because I needed to speak English, but because it was so novel to have him speaking English that it was, it was like I was dating someone new. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is exciting. It's literally a, two different people. <laughs> yes. It's a whole new person. I can, you know, it's almost like we're, we're just starting dating again. Uh-huh. So I quite like it. Um, and when we're in the States, I, I pretty much only speak to him in English. I go full on English. The only reason I would speak Italian to him would be if we have to say something really complex. It's going to take too long for him in English. Or if there's someone else with us and for whatever reason we don't want them to know what we're saying. Those are the only two reasons. That's a full other luxury of of that. You can speak in a secret language (laughs) right in front of your relatives and be like, don't you hate this person? (laughs) Not that you would do that. You never know. <laughs> I know. She's driving me crazy as well. <laughs> I promise we'll be out of here in 15 minutes. Uh, here's one thing I want to ask as a person who's gotten to speak to Claudio in English is that one of the things that Derek and I love about Claudio's English is that he often will say the phrase, this is the point. <laughs> That's right. We use that around our house sometimes. He does say that. Trying to explain something and then you'll just say, look, this is the point. Because he often says that. <laughs> this is the point. Forget well, how I'm trying to explain this. This is the point. Does he say this is the point in Italian as well? Is that like a thing that is about him? Is that his catchphrase or is that just an English shorthand? That is so funny because I have literally never noticed that. But now that you say it, I'm like, yeah, he does say that a lot in English. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't think it's something that he says regularly in Italian. I can't picture it. Well, keep an eye open for it because I would really like to know. (laughs) I will. I will. I don't think so, though. I think that's an Italianism. I mean, an Englishism (laughs) that he has. Love it. Well, we should probably leave it there. Always fun to explore languages. I know. So complex. And especially because as a person who doesn't speak anything but English. Oh, come on. You speak speak a smattering of Italian and Spanish. I know, but it's a smattering. It's a true <laughs> smattering. I'd have to leave the vast majority of my personality on the table <laughs> and just be like car, dog, house, friend, hello. The pen is on the table. <laughs> and this is the point. Two for dinner. <laughs> bag. 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 I'd like a bag. No, I don't even know how to say I'd like a bag. Just bag. <laughs> I'm basically just, you know, as if you're holding up slides of like a picture of like a duck pops up and I'm like, duck. And then you're like, a box pops up. Box. That's how I am (laughs) in both languages. Oh, come on. Don't sell yourself short. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Join us again. Bye. Need more show? Bonus episodes are released every single month. 
at patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast for as little as five dollars a month you'll get to hear even more you'll find a link in the show notes and if you jump on board at the fifty dollar level you get to dictate what topic we cover for example one patreon subscriber had us do an entire show on cuteness become the director for fifty dollars a month and support the show you love at the same time Thanks for listening. Tell all your friends, and we'll talk to you next week.